السلام عليكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما مثل الحياة الدنيا كما إن أنزلناه من السماء فاختلط به نبات الأرض من مما يأكل الناس والأنعام حتى إذا أخذت الأرض زخ وزينت وظن أهلها أنهم قادرون عليها أنتها أمرنا ليلا أو نهارا فجعلناها حصيدا كأن لم بالأمس كذلك نفصل الآيان كذلك نفصل الآيان لقوم يتفكرون والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب وتفاخر وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد 
كمثل غيث نعجب الكفار نباته ثم يهيج فتراه مصفرا ثم يكون حطاما وفي الآخرة عذاب شديد وبغفرة من الله ورضوان وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور سابقوا بكم وجنة عرضها كعرض السماء وجنة عرضها كعرض السماء ذلك فضل الله ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه يؤتيه من يشاء في الأرض ولا في أنفسكم ما أنصاب من مصيبة في الأرض ولا في إلا في كتاب من قبل أن نبرأها إن ذلك على الله يسير لكي لا تاسوا على ما فاتكم ولا تفرحوا بما آتاكم لكي لا تاسوا على ما فاتكم ولا تفرحوا بما آتاكم الله لا يحب كل مختال فخور الذين يبخلون 
الذين يبخلون الذين يبخلون ويامرون الناس بالبخل ومن فإن الله فإن الله هو الغني الحميد صدق الله مولا One second, inshallah. I'm just going to try to mute everyone again. Unmute myself. Assalamu alaikum I'm just trying to get used to this and mute everyone. Can can you hear me? Can I have a thumbs up? Yes? Hear me, alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you, uh, Anas. Uh, thank you so much for the beautiful recitation. And what Anas has done is, is uh, compile um, some beautiful uh, recitations from different parts of the Quran that describe the story of our lives and into the hereafter, where Allah Azza wa Jal speaks of uh, the purpose of this life and ultimately of, of finding our way back to Allah Azza wa Jal, where we experience the grander truth of this life. And this is inshallah what we're going to be talking about today is an introductory session. The purpose of it is to, to, to lay the groundwork for the series, inshallah. And it will address many pertinent points about uh, the meaning of our existence right now and the types of existences that we go through, all of which are very relevant to the story of the hereafter. So inshallah, if you can bear with me for a few seconds, I'm going to um, share inshallah a slideshow. I put together some slides that can inshallah help us out in terms of um, following the order and the sequence of this uh, presentation so bear with me as i share my screen and let me know if you're able to see it can you see this can i have a ns thumbs up okay alhamdulillah and, and, and again welcome to our series journey into the next world uh, today is nothing but an introduction, bi um, you know, One second. Okay, so why study the subject of the hereafter? This is a question that we all should ask. Is it something random? I mean, there's a, a host, uh, a, you know, a, a range of subjects that we can be addressing, especially after the month of Ramadan. Why talk about the hereafter? You know, uh, our experience of death it is quite uh, real. We've all experienced someone in our lives, whether family, a friend, a community member dying. Uh, SubhanAllah, just today, um, we received the news of uh, uh, one of our dear sisters from the Sunday school, Sister Nirham. Her sister just passed away in Egypt. And we ask Allah Azza wa that he enfolds in, her, enfolds in his mercy, that he grants our sister Nirham patience and, you know, and fortitude, her, her and her family, their loss is profound. Uh, this is a dear sister of hers, and subhanAllah, abruptly, uh, her life has, was ended, and uh, she goes back to Allah Azza wa Jal. But this is an experience we all go through, and nobody can escape it. Now, this begs the question, what's next? What comes after this death? What's going to happen? And this is a question that no human being ultimately can avoid, People have debated this question throughout time, but the interesting thing is the types of answers that people come up with when they confront this deep question. Most human beings seek to avoid this question altogether. Let us not talk about the next world or the next life, especially if they don't believe in it. Why? Because it makes them uncomfortable. It, it, it makes them uh, need, it, it, it puts them in, in a, into a state where they need to deal with the question of, 
accountability and responsibility and letting go of their of their attachments to this world nobody wants to be responsible few people bother to contemplate this question and people start to debate it and then they do something worse which is to come up with their own guesses as to what happens to the next in the next world this is indeed a question that has to do with the most significant reality of our lives there's nothing more pressing than understanding what's going to happen to us after our death but not just superficially we're talking about understanding it in a profound way there are religions by the way that speak of a heaven of another life after this life but you'll see incredible differences in terms of what that life looks like how real it is and then in terms of how vivid and detailed it is you're not going to understand or see excuse me a description an emphasis on the subject of the hereafter like that which the Quran provides for us nothing nowhere else will you find such emphasis in fact the, a, a good portion perhaps a third of the Quran is dedicated to this question of what's next why because it's a consequential question why because understanding what's going to happen next in our lives has a deep impact on our thoughts on our emotions on our feelings on our choices on on everything we do in our lives on on the decisions that we make on on our purpose that shapes who we become in this life where we go in this life and everything we do in this life it is a consequential question indeed and that's why Allah has placed so much emphasis on it and Allah sums up the reality of our existence beautifully in a statement that you and I are are asked to uh, say whenever we confront a loss in our lives, a loss of a human being, loss of something precious like health, like uh, you know a job, money, anything that you deem precious, and you're afflicted. Allah asks us in the Quran by recalling the most profound, the most essential truth, which is Inna Lillah wa Inna Ilayhi Rajiun. So you and I are supposed to say this whenever we face a trial. To Allah we belong. To Allah we return. Look at how simple. It came out of my mouth, to Allah we belong, to Allah we return. What is Allah saying? The entire message of the Quran is about this. You and I are not owners of ourselves. We're owned by Allah. There is an owner who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he is Al-Malik, the owner. And he calls himself the inheritor, who will inherit us back. And the other piece of the statement sums up the other part, part of reality. So we come from Allah. We belong to Allah and to Him we return. Look at how simple and how short the phrase is, yet that is what our life is about. Let me share with you something very special to me. This verse shook me. We can ask the question of why, why study the hereafter? Why place a good amount of our time reflecting upon it, understanding the Quranic message about it? So you're going to gain a lot. You're going to gain perspective. And I can tell you, if peace in our lives is going to be attained from gaining perspective, which is really the case, whenever you have perspective, when you have context, when you understand the bigger picture, you're going to attain peace in your life. Misery is attained from loss of perspective. Most people are confined into their little tiny experiences of life, and they don't want to think about the bigger picture. Or they come up with their own bigger picture that gives them comfort. So that's one aspect of why study the hereafter. It gives everything context. And it gives us meaning and purpose. But I have glad tidings for you. Allah in the Quran says this in Surah Sad, verse 46. This is one of the most beloved verses to me. He says, Inna Let me translate. We purified them with a pure thought, the remembrance of the home, of the hereafter. What does this mean? Allah is praising a special people in this earth, the special believers. And he says, we distinguish them, we've endowed them with a memory, meaning that Allah has opened their hearts and their minds to be cognizant and reflective upon what? He says their home in the, in the next world. That is to say that those who remember the next world constantly, they're conscious of it day and night. It's not a memory that is, uh, that is absent from them. It's not something they choose to run away from. They, make an effort to reflect upon it. Allah says those are special people and those people are purified by Allah Himself. So you and I tonight, when we have this opportunity to reflect on this subject and to spend a couple of months of our lives studying about it, by Allah, brothers and sisters, 
this verse informed my decision. I said, may Allah make us a community that is chosen by Allah, that is purified by Allah to be a people that reflect upon the day when we meet Allah, that we're cognizant and aware of it, that may Allah make us among those who fit into this verse. So it's not just about understanding what happens, it's about being selected by Allah. Allah loves those who spend their time thinking about the next world, but not in a matter that separates them from this world, no. But in a matter that brings them to life in this world, inshallah, may Allah make us among them. Thus our series, as I said. This is the reason we're studying this series, a journey into the next world. The questions that we're gonna to seek to answer, inshallah, include such things such as, what is the soul experience at the moment of death? I can tell you, you're not gonna find this in any philosophy, any religion like Islam, that informs you vividly about what your soul and my soul will experience from the moment when we catch our last breath, when we see that angel of death, when finally the angels that we were informed about by Allah show up. We're not able to see angels. We feel their presence. There's a moment in which you and I are going to be closing our eyes to this world and catching that last breath. And here you are seeing finally the angels filling the horizon. And may Allah make them the angels of mercy. The ones that died today among the believers witnessed them. The sister of Sister Nirham, who just passed away last night, got to see angels. SubhanAllah. We're not aware of what they're seeing, but yet the vision is so powerful for them. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about what happens in that moment of death and the, and the encounter with the angel of death. We're going to you know, describe what happens in the grave, inshallah. Then we're going to talk about the day of resurrection in which we'll summon out of our graves. How does that day of judgment look like in vivid detail? We're going to talk about the experience of that day of judgment and the accountability on that day and the reckoning of Allah on that day and how Allah himself shows up on that day the testimony of the Prophet, how we will meet Allah Azza wa one on one, what kind of questions will he ask us? We'll talk about the scale and the balance that will weigh our deeds. What does it look like? We're gonna talk about the experience of walking on the Sirat, that thin path, the razor sharp path that is thinner than a blade that is gonna take us to Jannah. And the path you know, off of which people can fall into the hellfire. What does the path look like? Who will we see on the path? How will our paths be lit knowing that everything on the Day of Judgment will be dark? Will you have light? Will you not have light? What will happen to the people of the Araf, the walls that separate the spaces of Jannah and the hellfire upon which there will be some people placed there? What will they see? What will Allah tell them? What will the meeting with Prophet Muhammad look like? These are the questions we're going to be talking about. What will be the moment in which we enter Jannah look like? Who will be with us? Who will not be with us? Where will Rasulullah be? And ultimately, when the doors of Jannah open, what do you and I see? How is that described in the Quran? Why is Allah spending so much time talking about this? It's to inform our imagination. It's to really color our lives with this reality because it's the grand reality. Ultimately, in Jannah, the ultimate moment is seeing Allah Himself. All the joys of Jannah do not compare to the moment in which you and I will be in the presence of Allah and get to see and behold Allah Himself in our vision in a way that is befitting of Allah Azza wa Jalla. We'll get to see the face of Allah and Allah is not a thing. How will that look like? And what kind of joys will it deliver to you and me? How will it fulfill our in, innermost desires? It turns out to be the greatest desire. We'll describe that moment, inshallah. This is a summary of what we'll be talking about beginning next week, inshallah. Let us resume this discussion, inshallah, addressing some important questions about this journey. Allah Himself, do you remember the question I said here? Where are we going next? This is a question that people debated and differed on, some choosing not to believe in it, some choosing to come up with their own theories as to what's next. It turns out that Allah Himself asks a question in the Quran in Surah Al Taqweer saying, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ لِلْعَالَمِينَ I love this rhetorical question from Allah. He Himself is saying, Where are you going? Where do you think you're heading? To nothing? To non being? to being uh, essentially just merged back into this earth and being reduced to dust? Do you really think that? Allah poses the question without necessarily answering here. The rest of the Quran answers. Then he says it's nothing but a reminder. And it's up to us to remember. A beautiful question from Allah, because it turns out you and I need to ask these existential questions. I would even say that 
the current um, trial that we're going through with this coronavirus, ultimately it's about compelling us to ask existential questions. The journey of life is a journey in which we're consumed. Our senses are consumed by life. We're drowned in materialism, in distractions. Sometimes we need to be nudged, to be, we need to be pushed. Our cores need to be shaken to awaken, to remember and to ask bigger questions. People, when they go through major trials, a death in the family, a major illness. I personally know someone, brothers and sisters, who was uh, not too long ago, about a couple of months ago, diagnosed with a terminal illness. And he's one of the chaplains, uh, may Allah have mercy on him and his family and cure him, was informed of the news of a terminal illness. I cannot imagine that you're being informed, you know, you have four or five months to live. SubhanAllah, would it not make you think about the bigger questions? existential questions are essential. You and I need to engage in this and spend time with our children talking about this. The three fundamental questions that most people choose not to reflect upon, they might ponder them here and there, but they're not serious about them. Questions that are asked in the Quran are these three. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? We find ourselves in this realm being sandwiched between two unknowns, two mysteries. What happened before we existed, where did we come from? It's an unknown for most people. Why are we here is where we are right now. Where are we headed is another unknown. We're sandwiched between two unknowns and mysteries and most people are blind to them. The question is, where do we come up with answers for them? You and I, are we capable of generating our own theories? The human being is so arrogant that he'll start to ponder and perhaps think that there is purpose and then say, you know what? Yeah, it means that we came from such and such and some people say, sure, either we're going to nothing or yeah, we're going to something, but that something is maybe reincarnation through another human being. People's theories. Allah says, it's not up to you and me to determine where you came from. Where we came from is a truth and Allah informs us of it. The creator, because we have no access to it. Where we're headed next from the moment of death is not something we can access physically or quantify with a physical experiment. It's not something we're capable of understanding right now until we see it. But Allah, the generous, the kind, the merciful, says pay attention to what I'm telling you. The only one who can inform you of what happens next is Allah. And we're blessed to have this divine book, a mercy from Allah, without which we'll have no clue, no understanding where we came from or where we're headed. The book of Allah gives us, gives us access into that realm that those without the Quran have no access to. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen for this book that we spend the month of Ramadan reflecting upon to understand the bigger picture vividly in a detailed way and without a doubt. Everything else is full of doubt. We definitely need answers for these questions because the margin of error is zero. Think of the stakes. Think of what happens if you got this question wrong in terms of where you're headed. What if you didn't believe that there's another world? How will your decisions be shaped? Why not enjoy this life? Why not bother? Why not oppress? Why not engage in a rat race? Why not consume possessions in this world and trample over people? After all, we're not accountable. See the consequences? Very serious. If we get this, it means we're going to have to stand in front of Allah one day and say, oops. We didn't know this. And Allah says the consequences are severe. So it's a matter of whether we end up in, in an eternal abode called paradise or not. So indeed, the stakes are high and we need answers. Here is the materialist's view, the nihilists, those who don't believe in God, those who choose to re rely upon themselves and their intellects to come up with answers. Allah actually tells us what they think. It's beautiful. It's, it's perennial. Throughout time, people have generated the same answers. And Allah gives us a glimpse of this in Surah Al-Jafiyah, verse 24, where he says, وَقَالُوا مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا وَمَا يُهْلِكُنَا إِلَّا الدَّهْرُ وَمَا يُهْلِكُنَا إِلَّا الدَّهْرُ وَمَا لَهُمْ بِذَلِكَ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِنْ هُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ And they say there is no life other than this life, this worldly life. That's what they're saying. There is no other life. Here, the one that we live in and we die in, and it's only the passage of time in our lives that destroys us. Meaning that when we die, we go back to nothing. Here's Allah's answers for all of them. 
he says, وَمَا لَهُمْ بِذَلِكَ مِنْ عَلْمِ He says, they have no knowledge. You see how simple that is? They have no knowledge. Where did they come up with that answer from? Did they have access to a book from the heavens on their own, other than the Qur'an? Or did they uh, establish a ladder to the heavens and then got access and the heavens told them there is no life afterward? Or did a jinn tell them that? Or their cousin? Who is it? Right? Allah says they have no knowledge or access. They don't have the tools of knowledge to access a realm that they have no ability to access. Because we have these organs and tools that allow us to experience this world. So how can we access a world that is not here? Allah says this is a form of arrogance and they are doing nothing but conjecturing. And it's very dangerous to conjecture, brothers and sisters. Because if we're left to our whims, we're going to come up with answers that suit us, that comfort us, to justify our lives and our decisions and feel comfortable until reality strikes us, indeed. Allah Azza wa continues on uh, by telling us essentially in the Quran, what, are, what if there is no life after this life, right? This question of what happens next should compel us to ask, well, what if there is no life? Shouldn't we be thinking about this, right? Here is what happens. Will there be purpose and meaning? Indeed, our lives will be absurd, brothers and sisters. How will we understand the pain that we experience in this life? How will we experience afflictions? I'm going to give you an example. How will you understand why somebody lost their job? How will you understand the story that happened with this friend of mine who got diagnosed with terminal illness? Many of us have diseases. How will you understand why am I having this illness? Aside from explaining it physically, why am I suffering in this life? What about this mosquito bite? You know when you're stuck by a mosquito? If there's no next life and there's no purpose to our living, even that becomes something of a disaster because suddenly it has no meaning. That mosquito bite has no meaning. Your child giving a hard time has no meaning. Uh, children that are born that are orphans has no meaning. Wars have, nothing has meaning. It is reduced. Life is absurd, you reduced to a life of absurdity. Absurdity and no meaning whatsoever. How will we also explain life's injustices? People commit injustices, but as victims, and we're going through right now a time in America where the issue of racism has come to the fore, where black Americans are, are dying, you know, subhanAllah, every other day, and they're experiencing this form of oppression, and it's, it's, it's a historical accumulation of pain and oppression, right? How would someone understand that indeed, well, there is a perpetrator of that injustice, but what about that victim that dies? What about George Floyd? He just was killed. Where does he receive his justice or is it gone? We have no opportunity or ability to understand the context that will ultimately redress the injustices without a next world. Indeed, life becomes absurd. If there is no next life to redress the injustice of this world, you and I will lose our minds. I know I would, right? You mean to tell me I'm gonna die? that those suffering in, 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 in Kashmir and the Rohingyans and the Uyghurs and, and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, and everywhere there's suffering and, and, and black Americans in this country, that's it, and the Native Americans, none of them is gonna find justice in their existence because after all, they've died suffering. What will happen in the next world for them, right? Without believing in the next world, injustice takes over brothers and sisters but yet within us there is a compelling instinct that says there has to be justice we have this yearning for it do you mean to say that you and i are born with this sense for justice for permanence for beauty and it ends up with nothing at the end how absurd is this if after all we see beauty in the universe we see perfect design of planets rotating around the sun we see a child being born and they automatically know certain things that they can do. I was looking, subhanAllah, I was watching my cat the other day and she was scratching um, to sharpen her nails. I'm like, why is she sharpening that? And my wife told me, subhanAllah, they're training for hunting. I said, well, they never hunted anything. They're, they're, they were born in, in our, well, we got them when they were like a day old. So I'm like, hunt what? They don't even know what to hunt in this life because they're fed. She says to me, it's their instinct. They're born with it. So even though they've seen no other animal, they've seen no, uh, they've not needed to hunt, yet since they were born, they knew they needed to go sharpen their nails because it's an instinct. Who gave them that? 
Why is that instinct in them? Why is that instinct for companionship, for justice in us, if it's not going to be met? Makes no sense whatsoever. What about the yearning for fulfillment and perfection? For permanence, what would that be addressed? Indeed, without any of this, our lives will be reduced to absolute absurdity. And we will now seek to derive worth from the worthless. Because if there is no next world, what does that mean about this world? It becomes your object of worship. Isn't it true? Because if there is nothing after it, what about my sense of joy? I need to seek it here. So the only thing in which I can seek joy is with the objects of this existence. So what will happen is that our yearning for God will be replaced with a yearning for things in this world that replace God. So the drinks, the, the illicit relationships, etc., the materialism become our gods because there is no God. There is no next world to fulfill it. Does that make sense? So the consequences, are, as we're seeing, are profound. What about accountability? If there's no next world, then we're not accountable and we can do anything that we wish to do. Everything indeed becomes meaningless and ultimately human beings experience despair and hopelessness. One second, inshallah. Okay, I love this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes by one of my kind of favorite uh, authors. Uh, this is a poet, his name is C.S. Lewis, who became a uh, also, you know, I think a religious thinker. I love to, you know, we've read many of his novels in our lives, but he has this part of a bigger quote. I'll save you from the bigger quote, but I, I extracted this part of it. And this for me is, is beautiful reflection on why we need to have another world. He says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we are made for another world. It's as simple as that. Think about it. You have desires in you for, for uh, food. You can find food. You have a desire for drink. Here it is. You can drink. For a relationship, a spouse, a child, you can experience this. What about permanence? What about that yearning for perfection, for the ultimate justice, for God? Where is that going to happen if we're going to die? Many of us die without ever fulfilling that deeper desire. He says, if that desire cannot be fulfilled here, and it cannot be, the desire for permanence cannot be fulfilled here, then there must be another world in which you're going to fulfill that desire. Otherwise, where did that desire come from if it has no meaning or purpose? Allah provides the answer in the Quran. Inna nahnu nuhyi wa numitu wa ilayna al-masir. We are the ones that give life. We are the ones that give death. To us is the return. Allah says further, Allah is the one that begins creation. Then he will return this creation, means he will bring us back after our demise. Then to him is the return. You see the emphasis, then to him is the return. And on the day when the hour comes, the criminals, the unjust, the deniers will be dumbfounded because they deliberately chose to ignore the truth and they've committed acts of injustice and oppression, believing that they're not going to be accountable. So they're stunned by what they see by Allah Azza wa on that day. Then Allah poses the question about purpose. Everything is in the Quran. Rhetorically asking the question, He says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, did you think we created you with all this sophistication? The sophistication of this universe, the symmetry, the design, the sun and the moon, us coming from tiny seeds and embryo and a sperm, having children, connections, all that, earth rotating around the sun, all that, without purpose, everything has purpose. Allah says, do you think we made you to play? There is nothing afterward? How ludicrous is that notion? Indeed, Allah is posing the question with a clear answer. And then he says about the people who committed injustices. He says, did the people who committed uh, essentially heinous acts, you know, engage in sin day in and day out, constantly, did they really think we're going to make them like the people who believed and engage in righteous lives? That's it. So life is going to be over. Everybody is equal. He says, have we lost our minds? That, that even common sense compels us to think it's impossible. That the oppressor is equated 
with a victim. There's no way that the righteous who live the life of integrity, of faith, of devotion, of service, it's just going to be reduced to nothing, just as the one who engage in a life of injustice and oppression and, and materialism and so on and so forth. He says, well, they made a judgment and their judgment is bad, profoundly, profoundly stupid and bad, so to speak. Allah then says, then what is the real life? What is this life? This life, Allah describes what it is. He says, this life, ultimately it's a test, but within it, you're going to experience this uh, amusement and diversion, life of distractions. But indeed, but indeed, the next life is the life of the real life. Al hayawan here means real, vivid life. The real, vivid life. And there is no real, absolute life but the life of the hero. This life is a partial life. Partial life. We're going to go through this, what's described as the five, as the five uh, stages of existence. So what the Quran does is take us through a story that enables us to understand where we came from, why we're here, what this life is about, and what happens next. Next, through, um, By taking us through this journey, through the stages, what's called the stages of existence of the human being. And there is, turns out to be in our cosmology, in Islamic thought, in Islamic cosmology, what's called the five stages of existence uh, that describe our cosmic journey. Number one is what's called the pre-worldly life. It's called the life of the covenant. We'll describe it, inshallah, shortly. Number two is the world of form, the phenomenal world, which is the life we live in, in, live in right now that we know. I know all people on earth are number two, and that's the life they really know about. But the previous life, the pre-worldly life, is the unknown for most people. Then the next stage of existence, the next life you and I will live, and billions of people are already in it, in it. So people are either in number two or three, That not four or five. Number, four, number three is the world, what's called the life of, or the existence of the barzakh. Barzakh means the interspace, the barrier, uh, the time, the space that separates this life, number two, from number four and five. What's number four? The day of judgment in which we are summoned out of the life of the Barzakh. This interval between death, from the moment of death until resurrection is one life. And it has its all, like uh, its entire existence, by the way. It's not like the life of the hereafter. It's different, right? But number four is the moment in which we are resurrected or taken out of the life of the Barzakh to stand before Allah Azza wa Jal. It's also a, a life that has a beginning and an end. All lives that are described, two through five have a beginning and an end. One is interesting. One has a beginning, but it begins with the souls. We'll describe it shortly. Number five, after the day of judgment, Allah says there is no third, either eternal, eternal paradise or partial or eternal hell, depending on the state of the human being. This is it. And that number five says we're eternal beings. We're ultimately spiritual beings uh, who happen to exist in this realm with a bodily experience, not the opposite, not the not bodily beings with a spiritual experience. We're actually spiritual beings with a bodily experience that one day ends. Let's describe the first stage, the pre-worldly life, what's called the world of the Malakut, that contains the spiritual realm, the heavenly realm. Uh, Allah gives us this glimpse into it. Uh, this is really beautiful for us to understand what happens before I was, uh, Adam existed, before all of us were turned into the physical bodies that we are. Where did, what happened before? Is there, was there a life for us? Turns out we had a life. Allah beautifully describes in, in verse 172, Surah 7, Surah Al-A'raf, and this is a, a very significant verse for you and me to understand. You and I are going to be separated from the rest of existence that believes or has other notions of what happened before we were born or before we were placed on this earth as a humanity. Many people believe we came from nothing, from non-being. Allah says, no, you didn't come from non-being. Sure, you came from Allah, but what happened as when Allah created us? Did he create the body first or the souls first? So Allah says in this verse, with أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِن بَنِي آدَمَ مِن ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ Allah says, and when we 
when your Lord brought forth, brought forth from the descends, descendants of Adam alayhi salam, his progeny, all the progeny of Allah, and he said to them, am I not your Lord? They said, sure, Ya Allah, you are our Lord. We testify. Then Allah says, so that you will never say, we did not know or we were unaware. What is Allah talking about? This is again what's described as the realm of the Malakut. What Allah is saying is before we were placed into this earth from the first human being, Allah took all of our souls, all humanity. Can you imagine? Billions upon billions upon billions. He took all of their souls out. They were created by Allah initially before the bodies were created. And Allah says it's a breath of God. We're not going to understand it, but we feel it. It's in us. It's encased in our bodies. It's permanent. It's eternal. It's a breath of God. It's what endows you with your humanity, with your intellect, with your knowledge, with your, with your uh, desire for, for affection, with love, with kindness, with all these beautiful qualities are part of your soul. Allah says, I took all of these souls and I put them in front of me. There was a ground encounter with Allah himself. You and I were present in a pre-worldly existence before Allah himself. You say, wait a minute, I don't remember that. Sure, Allah made us forget this in this world, in this realm. And Allah asked us when we witnessed Allah. And we don't know exactly what we saw, but we were there. He says to all of us in that realm, am I not your Lord? All of us without exception said, La ilaha illallah, we bear witness, Ya Allah, that you are the creator. There is no God but you. There is no creator but you. That's what La ilaha illallah means. We're seeing it already. We're seeing that there is no owner but you. We're seeing that no, there's no giver of life but you. We're seeing that there's no giver of death but you. We're seeing that there's no provider but you. We're seeing that you're, there's no sustainer than you. We're seeing that there's no truth but you. You're everything, Ya Allah, and we're your servants. We testified without any confusion. Then Allah said to us, now that you've taken your testimony and you signed the covenant with me, no excuses for you that you'll come in the next world and say, I didn't know, I had no idea. So what Allah did was take this encounter and bury it within our souls. Then Allah created the human being, created Adam in his body, placed the spirit in him, the soul in him, and our father Adam and Hawa, you know, delivered all of us, all humanity, and all of us have these souls that one day stood before Allah, but Allah veiled us from that memory or from that encounter. But the memory is buried inside of us. And the journey of life becomes a journey through which we engage in an effort to remember that encounter with Allah. That's why you and I, when we are you know, recite the Quran, listen to something that reminds us of Allah, we're moved. It turns out your soul is speaking to you and me about that grand encounter with Allah. Allah says, you came from there. You had an existence from me. The shahada is buried in you, brothers and sisters. And there's nothing more beautiful than to see the signs of Allah here and really testify to Allah that there is no God like we testified when we saw Allah or when we encountered Allah. Number two is this world. Allah placed Adam and all of us in this world. It's called the world of mulk. The mulk is um, the world of this dominion, so to speak. As in Islamic cosmology, there is something called the Ark of Descent. We descended from the pre-worldly realm into this realm to be tested. It's a short realm. It's the shortest realm, and we're existing in it right now. Characteristics of this realm is that it's short. As you see, we die. We begin a life, then we end it. It's transient. It's fleeting. Allah describes it to be like a plant or a rose. You know, you, you see the rose growing before your eyes and then when it blooms and you're, you think it's going to be permanent, it goes away. And such, as, such are the joys of this world. Our youth has an end. Our uh, entertainment has an end. Our children have an end. You and I have an end. I have an end. Everything ends. Allah says, your ability to have pleasure ends like a rose. It has to go away and wither away. It never completely satisfies you, does it? Every experience is incomplete. It's veiled. In this world, we're not able to see the next world or to see the pre-world. But Allah gives us a vision in our hearts to be able to see it, but it's veiled from our eyes. It's the realm of trials and tests, as we, as we see. It's full of distractions, and it's the realm where the shaitan operates, where he deludes us, because Allah made him exist here as a test. 
in, in case we're asking, why is there a shaitan? Because Allah has the grand ultimate wisdom. And he decided that life has no meaning if we're not tested. We cannot all be in paradise if we didn't go through a test. Out of the wisdom of Allah, and part of it is to allow the shaitan to be a part of our existence and to distract us. But Allah says, no worries, the shaitan has no way over you as long as we are with Allah. Allah is the protector. It's also a realm in which we witness countless signs of Allah, of truth, that remind us of Allah, that remind us of the next world. So we're not left without nothing. The Quran is a sign of Allah that points us to all the signs within us and in the cosmos, summoning us to remember where we're going. So alhamdulillah, we have the this theater of signs from Allah Azza wa The third world is the world of the Barzakh, as we said. This is called the Ark of Ascent in Islamic cosmology, where we ascend, actually, not descent. Most people think we're descending into the grave. We're ascending at the moment of death into the heavens, into that realm with Allah Azza wa But it begins with the grave. The grave is a physical object. Don't think that dead soul is there. It's in a place that we cannot see. But it is in a space that separates the life from this, the, the soul from this life and the next life. It lives in it for a short period of time until the day of judgment. In that realm, the veil is removed. This is the realm we're going to describe in the next session, inshallah, on Wednesday. What happens when you see the angel of death and the veil is removed and you witness the angels, what happens in that experience until the moment of resurrection will be the subject matter of the next session. Then there is. Uh, okay, okay, something else about this uh, realm is that when the veil is removed, we witness, as Allah says, uh, what's called ilm uh, yaqeen and you know what's called haqqul yaqeen, or excuse me, aynul yaqeen wa yaqeen. Allah says you're going to see a vision with a vision of certainty. There's no illusion in what you're seeing, and you're going to witness haqqul yaqeen, as He says in Surah Al Takathur. Here we cannot we cannot really see with our eyes full, with full certainty, but we can see it in our hearts and grasp with the knowledge of certainty. Next is the Day of Judgment, which will be the subject matter that we begin with two weeks from today, inshallah. What happens when Allah resurrects us? What? How does the world end? Allah takes us through a vivid journey in the Quran. This will be the subject matter from session three in two weeks, and inshallah for probably you know a month and a half. We're gonna be walking through the Day of Judgment, uh, and it happens at a point in time where all the creation of Allah all the human beings and all the jinn will be resurrected, gathered to stand before Allah Azza wa Among the names of the Day of Judgment are these that Allah describes in the Quran. Yawm uh, al-Qiyamah, the Day of Rising. al yawm al-Akhir, the last day. as the hour. Yawm al the Day of Resurrection. Yawm al the Day of Coming Out. Yawm al-Fasl, the Day of Judgment, the Day of Recompense, the Day of Eternity, the Day of Reckoning, the Inevitable Reality the day of meeting each other, the day of deprivation, the day of the promise, the day of returning, uh, the, the day of returning back, excuse me, the day of noise and clamoring. Why, why is Allah describing it with so many names in the Quran? To illustrate to all of us the, the profound seriousness of that day, that it's the grand day of our existence, that we live for that day, that it's the day that determines our destinies. And all these descriptions in the titles of that name, of that day, Capture an aspect of that day that we're going to describe, inshallah, in the coming sessions, bi'idhnillah. Uh, the eternal abode, which is life or existence number five. After the day of judgment, Allah gives us a judgment. We ask Allah to make us among the people of the eternal abode, paradise, bi'idhnillah, and Jannah al-Firdaus. We're going to talk about Jannah al-Firdaus vividly, uh, deriving, inshallah, our insights and our understanding from the Quran and the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu and we'll also talk about the hellfire bi'idhnillah. It's a real life, it's it's not fiction. Uh, there is no third possibility for the next world, but these two were literally created for paradise, we're made for it. There is no future without this future. But the highest and most sublime experience is not even Jannah. It is to be in the divine presence of Allah and to witness and see Allah. It's the greatest joy in Jannah, we'll talk about it bi'idhnillah. Uh, Allah says, essentially, within yourselves, don't you see? We're going to talk a couple of minutes, inshallah, about the evidences. Do we see evidence of the next world? A lot of people say no. Materialists say no. Because if for them, what's real is matter only, objects, that's it. 
matter, atoms, if I can measure it and quantify it, then it's real. Anything that I cannot see or measure is not real. Allah says, look within yourselves. Don't you see we're all a mini universe, brothers and sisters. We all came from a seed. And Allah looks, says, look at the parallels. We originated from a sperm and an egg. Then you grow through this progression, a baby with organs, then grow into a child, into a teenager, into a husband and wife with children, and then into old age where you see your own you know, uh, skin's wrinkle. Then you're, you experience your death. Allah says, doesn't it remind you of the rest of the world? Look at the sun. It came also out of you know, a place that is the seed of it, so to speak. And it goes through all its own journey. Wallahi, Allah says in the Quran, uh, by the sun and its glory and its light. Look at it, it's going through a, a journey from nothing where it originates like a baby, as if the day represents your life. The day itself that we go through represents our life. So it goes from childhood and then the light glows and then it starts to set as if the middle of the day is like our youth or, or our age of strength. And then the sun starts to descend and the light shrinks reminding us of our age and then it goes away. And then what happens next is that we have a moon. But notice the day ended, the moon came out, but the moon itself has a journey of beginning and ending and what happens at the end what happens at the end is that the sun comes out again Allah's telling us don't you see the pattern in the cycle of life things begin with a seed they grow they seemingly die only to come back again and Allah says this over and over in the Quran I swear by the twilight and by the night and when it unfolds and by the moon when it reaches its fullness, you shall proceed onwards from stage to stage. It makes no sense that the moon descends and there is no sun the following day. We know this. Allah says exactly the same way you're going to die and then rise out like the sun. SubhanAllah. The cycle is repeated in the universe indeed. The parallels are astounding in our universe. Here is the seed, your seed and my seed, brothers and sisters. The embryo and the egg and the sperm Subhanallah, how often do we reflect on this? Like the seed of the universe into a baby. And this, what you're seeing in front of you is this exact parallel. This is a seed of a plant. It's growing in front of your eyes. Look at it growing, exactly like the human being. The parallels are astounding. And then this is the universe originating also from a seed. The Big Bang came from something smaller than an atom. They say it's the size of a proton. You can place trillion of it, a trillion of the origin of the universe. The whole universe was contained in a thing. You can place a trillion of it on a needle point. Allah says, don't you see the parallels? Where did that come from? And here's a description of the journey of the cosmos from nothing on the left, as you can see, growing and expanding with hundreds of billions of galaxies with beautiful symmetry and design only to be ripped at the end and the demise happens and we go back to Allah Azza wa Jal. Here's a summary of what we're going to be going, inshallah, we're wrapping up. In the next few episodes, inshallah, we're going to take you through what you're seeing right now. This is a capture of the journey of the hereafter. It begins with death at the top of the screen on your right. We'll talk about this next time, the death and the grave, inshallah. It might take a couple of sessions, inshallah, and then into the blow of the trumpet that commence the day of resurrection out of our graves, into the end of creation, then talk about resurrection itself, the day of gathering, the grand intercession that is given to Rasulullah then the moment where Allah himself arrives into the testimonies of the prophets, then beginning the accounting of the human being, then setting the scales, the mizan, then giving the records, how will that take place? We're gonna talk about it, then meeting Rasulullah then the sirat that separates us from Jannah, then what's called al-a'raf, we'll, we'll talk about this, then Jannah or the Hellfire, and ultimately seeing the face of Allah Azza wa Jal. Let me end with this. Uh, this is a short video. I absolutely like loved it. Summed up kind of the gave a description of the journey of the human being, like in a minute, the cosmic journey of the human being from nothing to something, and it gives you a perspective on the beautiful design of Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, it's not necessarily made by Muslim, but you can, you know, I ask Allah that He 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 puts you into the story in in just. Uh, the span of a minute, and we'll end with that, inshallah. If you can bear with me, I'm gonna inshallah stop the share here and share this other slide, inshallah, or excuse me, the one minute movie.
so bear with me, inshallah. I'm still like uh, trying to become more efficient with all of this. Okay, give me a second, inshallah. Tell me if you're seeing this. Are you seeing this other screen? Yes. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, inshallah, this will take a minute and then we'll wrap it. So Jazakumullah khair for this. I just wanted to share this. It's kind of a quick summary of our journeys. And it really compels the question about how can all of this not have this, you know, design and purpose and a designer behind it. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. It's a blessing to be able to reflect on the grand journey back to Allah. And I remind everyone, the journey back to Allah and reflecting on it is not a type of reflection that says separate from this life, as I said. Absolutely not. If anything, it should give us purpose. It's a journey that, you know, understanding, the understanding of it should give us life, give us vigor, give us meaning that we live our day with purpose and meaning without being worshipers of this world. That's why we study this. Ultimately, it's the, it's, it's the demand of Allah Azza wa Jal, and we're all going back to that grand meeting with Allah. We ask Allah to bless all of us, to grant us purpose and meaning, and to, give, to make us people of faith who are selected and chosen by Allah to be a people that remind themselves and are reminded constantly. And remember the day of meeting Allah, that it becomes the best day of our existence, the, may, the day in which we meet Allah and He's happy with all of us. Jazakumullah khair, brothers and sisters. We'll end here, inshallah. Next week, come, inshallah, be, try to be on time. We'll start, inshallah, to, we're, we're gonna start 8.45, inshallah. We gave you a little bit more time, but we hope you get used to the time. 10 minutes after Maghrib, log in, and inshallah, we'll begin with a recitation for a few minutes and then do the same thing bi'idhnillah and perhaps next time we'll not have also some time for questions and answers but let's wrap here inshallah if you have any questions send them my way inshallah and I can address them next time barakallah feekum uh, let me just see if there's anything here before we um... okay so somebody was recommending also like uh, looking at uh, other time lapses of the universe if you look at YouTube you're going to see astounding things that remind you of Allah wallahi and our children should see it. Barakallah feekum. Uh, final reminder, brothers and sisters, uh, to make dua for each other, to also remember the oppressed, our, you know, black Americans and uh, black brothers and sisters who are suffering tremendously. This is a time to show up for them, to understand their pain and suffering. But also, I'm asking everybody to make dua um, for Sister Nirham and uh, her sister who just passed away. We ask Allah to have mercy on her sister. And to make her among the dwellers of Jannah al Firdaus. Uh, she's in that realm right now. We ask Allah to pardon her, forgive her, and to grant our sister Nirham and her family strength and patience through this difficult time in their lives. Allahumma ameen, and may Allah have mercy on all of us. Jazakumullah khairan, inshaAllah. Until next week, Wednesday, inshaAllah, after Maghrib, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.